In 2000, we bought an abandoned 100-acre farm in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. We spent years cleaning it up, built a new house, and now are trying to make it a functional homestead farm. Welcome to Red Tool House. Hello everybody, welcome to Red Tool House. In this video, I'm going to try a maintenance trick that my grandfather taught me. Grandfather was in the, in the war, and that generation, of course, did a lot of things differently. Some good, some not so good. But he, uh, he taught me a trick that I, I don't know that everybody's going to agree with and going to appreciate. So let's get into it. Well, I'll try to quit being so cryptic, but what we're looking at here, where I'm standing is our barn that, if you've been following the channel for a while, you know I'm slowly, very slowly, building the barn, working my way this way as I add on to it. And the reason why it takes so long is we're milling our own lumber from the property we clear here. So as we clear more pasture land, of course we saw, uh, uh, saw all the, the logs up into timber. And we're building this out of pine. We've got a lot of Virginia pine and we've got a lot of tulip poplar. So pine and poplar, I'm taking all my support structures and building them out of pine and then the siding and, and some of the other um, structural elements I'm building out of poplar. Well, one thing we have in abundance in West Virginia is carpenter bees. Uh, some of them, some people call them boar bees, but it's kind of funny when people say that around here, it sounds like you're talking about like a Mattel toy for girls. Anyway, so these beams are, are made out of pine and they are facing southwest. So they're getting a lot of sun exposure. Obviously, as we get warmer, warmer days and get into the spring and summer months, they're really going to get a lot of uh, direct sun on them. And that's really caused them to dry out. Well, the carpenter bees just eat this stuff up. Any exposed wood that we have, they will wear it out. And in fact, in the front of my workshop, uh, where I have my fascia around the garage door, it looks like somebody's taken a drill with a half inch bit and just drilled holes in it. They have just worn that out. And I don't want to spray them. I don't necessarily want to kill all the carpenter bees because they are really good pollinators and they help out for other reasons. So I don't want to kill them, but I obviously don't want them drilling holes in my barn and, and turn it into sawdust. So these beams uh, being exposed, the carpenter bees are going to be munching on them this year. Um, they're drying out. So I definitely want to get uh, some sort of treatment on there. Now I could have built this with pressure treated lumber and that would have helped with rot but I've noticed that pressure treated lumber isn't even necessarily pest resistant. Uh, quite a few years ago when the boys were smaller I built a playground for them out of all pressure treated lumber and the carpenter bees even though I stained it and, and finished it carpenter bees just wore that out after a couple years. I mean, there are places I could take four by fours and just break them like that after about five years because they were so perforated. So I could spray this with chemical and treat it and do all that type of stuff, but as soon as you cross that threshold, as soon as you start spraying, then of course you're introducing some non-organics into the, into the property. So it becomes a head scratcher. So do I treat this somehow with chemicals or pesticides or something like that that's going to keep the carpenter bees at bay? Again, I don't want to kill them, so I don't want to necessarily load up on pesticides, nor do I necessarily want all that leaching out. But I'm going to have to put some chemical on that. So what is it Grandpa taught me? Okay, so a little controversial, and just because the greatest generation in the world did it doesn't necessarily make it right, right? But, like I said, if, we're gonna, if I'm gonna cross that threshold and, and introduce something non-organic to my barn wood to try to save it, then I've crossed that threshold. But one thing that he always did, and I've, I've seen him do it for years on his buildings and barns, and one thing that Grandpa always had, of course, was a lot of used motor oil. He was really into maintenance. He did his own maintenance himself. He was actually a mechanic on an aircraft carrier in World War II, worked on airplanes, so Grandpa knew how to take care of stuff. Well, he always had a bunch of oil left over. So with the used motor oil, what do you normally do with that? Well, obviously you can recycle it. Some people use it in their chainsaws, which I'm guilty of that. I use it in my chainsaw. I know some of you chainsaw guys are like, you're burning up your chain, you're burning up your bar. Yeah, maybe. I, I usually don't let bars last that long. So. Um, so we've got this used motor oil, and I'm the same situation. I've done maintenance on the tractor, on the side-by-side, -side, on the vehicle, so I've got an accumulation of motor oil. So this trick is simply just going to require some sort of receptacle, smaller receptacle for my oil, and a drill with a spade bit. So here's what we're going to do. 
Well, since I don't have any of my rafters in place, then I don't have to worry about trying to work around them. But what I'm going to do, I've got an inch and a quarter spade bit. And the reason why I chose an inch and a quarter spade bit is because it is a little bit wider than the diameter of this oil bottle. So I'm simply going to drill a hole in the top, in the dead center of this post. And that's the reason why I wanted to do the inch and a quarter. I want to make it the diameter, just a little bit bigger than the diameter of this oil bottle. So I've got some spent oil in this. It's actually about half full. Ideally, you'd want to make it completely full. And all I'm going to do is simply turn it upside down and shove it in that hole. And what's going to happen, wood is hydroscopic. And that's a $5 word, obviously, for it absorbs things, just like a sponge. So this wood being dried out is going to absorb this oil. So what it's going to do is slowly, osmotically, it will pull the oil down through the wood and will actually treat it from the inside out. So some of y'all may be grasping your chest and saying, oh my goodness, you're putting motor oil into your barn and introducing it to your property. Yes, I, I get it. I, that is an issue. I'm not crazy about it. But I'm also not crazy about replacing my, my beams on my barn every couple of years either. So it's one of those things. you got to weigh the pros and the cons there. I'm not using a pesticide, so I'm not killing the carpenter bee. This makes it very, very um, undesirable for the carpenter bee. As, as Grandpa showed me that when, when this oil soaks through, the carpenter bee is going to move on to something that's a little more tasty that motor oil doesn't like. So what I can do is just come back and check on this on a regular basis and just see how long it takes for this oil to draw out. And what should happen, gravity and osmosis should take over and just slowly pull all that oil down through. And I may have to fill it up quite a bit uh, off and on. It's not like uh, half a quart is going to take care of this entire beam. So I like doing this simply because the other alternative would be to take all this used motor oil and put it in a pump sprayer. And I've seen that done and I'm still contemplating if I want to do that with the siding on the barn versus trying to paint it, keep it stained, all those type of things because carpenter bees are still going to wear that out. But with a pump sprayer, spraying it on that siding or on the side of anything, these posts, A, you're just only treating so far in, B, there's a lot that's going to leach down onto the ground and really start to contaminate the soil, and C, anytime you aerosol something and spray it, you have the opportunity of introducing it all over the place. So to me, this while we're still putting oil, introducing motor oil into our, our barn area here, this is the, the way to do it with the, with the most control. When I see this start to weep and, and maybe ooze out of some spots, and I'm like, okay, let, let's back it down. Let's let it dry out and soak that up some more because I'm giving too much oil to it. So in this situation, maybe it'll, it'll back down and, uh, and take it as it needs it. So I can just keep coming back and checking on it. Now, obviously, the issue here with a, you know, a high wind or something may blow that off, so I could even come back and with a wire and, and strap it over or do something like that. Uh, but we'll see how this works, and, and I'll do some updates on it as we move on. So what do y'all think? Let me know below. Comment below and let me know what you think. I know some of y'all are building log cabins, and you're milling it, it off of your own land, so you're not buying pre-treated lumber. What do you plan to do to keep the uh, pests and the insects from wearing that out? Comment below, let me know. If you think I'm an idiot, you may say, well, Troy, we knew that 100 episodes ago. We didn't need this video to prove that. But if you think there's an issue there, comment below and let me know. I'd be curious to see what other people are doing to handle this type of situation. Again, something that uh, my grandfather used to do and did all the time doesn't necessarily make it right, but it's the option I'm going to look into right now. All right, everybody, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Comment below again, give us feedback. Subscribe if you haven't, and uh, check us out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 4.30. That's when we release a new video. All right, take care, everybody.